I created that urgency for him to come across. And so he started going across when he normally probably wouldn't have. He would have waited for more of an open spot to go through. And But he got out there and got turned around and, and he got hit by a car. And, um, you know, it just, it was, it's to this day, I can still see that vividly in my yeah. mind how it all happened. And Welcome to the Miracle Bridge. I am a professional board certified hypnotist, a heart math coach, and a master health NLP practitioner. I am also the author of the book, The Miracle Bridge. I've spent over 25 years working in the subconscious mind. I am a specialist at showing you how to identify and eliminate the hidden nuances in your perception that sabotage and undermine your life. Come learn how to transform your pain and frustration into healing and understanding. Please join me and my guests as we explore the vast world of healing through the subconscious mind. I'm Mike Simpson, the host, and I'd like to introduce you to my guest, Phil Cook. Phil is one of my best friends, and we've been friends since the sixth grade. And we're going to be discussing some really important things today, and really happy to have Phil here. In fact, it needed to be him to be my first guest. We've got a really, really interesting story, and I'm excited to share it with you. I'd like to draw your attention to a few items on the desk here. I've got a jar with a lid on it, and I'm going to explain what this is in a few minutes. And I've also got a copy of my book, The Miracle Bridge. And Phil, um, his story is featured in Chapter 10, of the Miracle Bridge, and today we're going to talk about it. So those of you who have listened or who have read this story, you'll be able to hear some of Phil's own words. The topic I'd like to discuss today, the first topic, um, is titled Limiting Beliefs. Now this is an NLP term, but it essentially explains how we can have a perception that actually limits our ability to work through a problem. And to illustrate what a limiting belief is, I'd like to use this little object lesson, this uh, lid with a jar on it. Now, I talk about this concept in my book, but you can also go out on YouTube and there's a video you can watch where a scientist performed an experiment. What he did is he took a hoard of fleas and he put them in the jar and then he put the lid on top of the jar So he locked the fleas inside of the jar, and then he took the jar, and he put the jar in a dark room for three days. After three days, he brought the jar out of the room, and he simply took the lid off of the jar. And what do you imagine happened with those fleas? Any ideas, Phil? I would imagine they just stayed in the jar. That's right. The fleas had become conditioned that they could not jump from the jar. So there was a perception that was actually backed with evidence. And so this is what I want to talk about today. So a flea can easily jump the height of this jar, but when it's been trapped and confined in that jar with the lid on, and it's jumped and banged against that lid multiple times, it develops pain. It understands that any time it tries to jump beyond a certain level, it brings pain. And so with that pain comes a perception and a limitation that I can't jump any higher than this, and I have a mountain of evidence to prove that it's not possible. I've got a lifetime of evidence to prove that I cannot escape from this jar. So it's it's fascinating. Those fleas became trapped in that jar even though the lid had been removed. And so the limitation, the lid, had been removed. Now what makes this story even more fascinating is the next generation of fleas that were born in the jar actually inherited that same limitation. So the fleas were unable, the baby fleas were unable to escape the jar in the same way that the parents. And so that, that can give us an idea about our environment and how it conditions our perception and how limitations, perceived limitations, actually trap us in a perception, and and even more so, trap us in an attitude or perhaps even in a disposition. So 
limiting beliefs is what we want to explore today. And also, we want to talk about depression. Now, in previous podcasts, I've talked about my expertise. Um, I won't go into that here, but for 25 years, I have delved into the subconscious mind. I am an expert at understanding and digging to the root cause of emotional suffering. But when I throw the word depression out, you think of this stigma now, I want you to think about this. Everyone listening to this, either, either you suffer from depression or you know someone who suffers from depression. And there's a helpless, hopeless stigma that's attached to that word. I don't like that word. Um, in fact, often when people receive a diagnosis for depression, then there is a narrative that travels with that concept that breeds hopelessness and helplessness. And perhaps there's a pill you can take that can lessen the symptoms, and that may work for some people some of the time. But what do you actually do to resolve emotional suffering? And what, in fact, is depression? And I'd like to start talking about that today. I'd like to explore the stigma around depression. I'd also like to discuss the limitations of perception and of depression because when that lid is on the jar there's no escaping and when you've hit your head against that lid enough times you'll stop trying and in my opinion depression is nothing more than when you finally accept that there's no way out of the jar and you stop trying and so that's the that's the version of depression that I would like to debunk today and I would like to invite you to open your your perception, expand your narrative. And Phil's got a story that t- falls right in alignment with what we're talking about. And again, in Chapter 10 of The Miracle Bridge, you can read Phil's story. You can also read about the fleas in the jar in the book. But I'm excited today to introduce Phil, to bring him in. And maybe, maybe let's start, Phil, by um, talking about how we met, when we met. And, right. and I hope, you know, this is a very sensitive topic, a very painful topic. and um, Not so much anymore. From, from the bottom of my heart, mm-hmm. I appreciate you coming here. This is a raw conversation. This is real life. And F- Phil has volunteered to share his story because of how many people his story has already helped. I've had many people contact me who have read the book that that were deeply inspired and even transformed through hearing your That's story. Good. That makes my heart happy. Yeah. So back in sixth grade, mm-hmm. um, my family moved from uh, Orem to Linden. And this is the first time that I had met Phil. Mm-hmm. And Phil had gone through a very traumatic experience right before we ever crossed paths. And um, how, how do you feel? Is that okay if, if oh. I talk about it? Or would, oh, or would, you, would you like to no, explain what happened? No, it's, it's the worst of it's been put behind. I mean, okay. It's all, I, I see it as more positive now. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to share to, because I know that it can help people. Thank you. So Phil um, had an older brother named Ronnie. Uh, he was your hero. Mm-hmm. He was the toughest kid on the block. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. he he was your mentor. He was your sidekick. Kept me out of trouble, or Most got you in trouble? No, he he kept no, you he out was, of trouble. He was the good one in the family. Okay. Was, Phil was, Phil had a nose for getting into trouble. True. <laughs> Is that still true? I um, can't say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's probably a good answer. I'm a little more wise now. Yeah, that sounds good. Phil asked uh, Ronnie to go on his paper route with him. Actually, on, it was the other way around. Okay. Ronnie asked me to go on his because uh, his partner, they were in business together doing the paper route, couldn't oh. make it that day. So oh. he wanted me to go with him. So he asked you to go with him. Right. And take it from there. Let's keep talking yeah, about it was, that. Uh, yeah, it was a cold February evening and after school, and, and uh, his partner couldn't go with him and wanted me to go with him. So I went with him, and it was, it was February, and it was cold. Man, it was really cold. And 
um, I was just kind of a, a pain in his side the whole time because I was cold and um, ornery, probably hungry as well. And um, but he was that that type that just was had a big heart to look after me. I was kind of that. I always he's always trying to keep me out of trouble. And because um, I had to find, like you said, I had a nose for finding trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but I was with him and and uh, we were doing this paper route and. And uh, he was taking great care of me because I was I was cold, and he had a set of he had a pair of gloves, and he'd give me one of the gloves, and we'd switch off gloves, and you know one set of gloves between the two of us, so we had one on each. We each had a glove to wear, and we'd switch off, and um, went through the night, delivered the papers. We had to cross a, a a major street. We call it State Street here in in Orem. A busy road. Yeah, I was the main busy road, and. It went through the towns and all, and, and we really had no business crossing that road and uh, at that age, and I was only 10, and he was 12, and but we um, finished up the paper out on the other side of that road, and we're coming back, and I was just, couldn't wait to get home because it was so cold, and it, I guess, I don't know, it was about 5 or 5.30, just starting to um, get dark, and we get to State Street, and it's a it's, um, rush hour, and... Um, I get to the, we get to the street there, and I'm just, it's just rush hour, cars going back and forth, just a lot of cars, just really busy, a lot of traffic, and me, without a care, as normal, just froggered my way across it, and I thought my brother was right behind me, and I get to the other side of the road, and I turn around, and he's still on the other side of the road, and I'm just upset, I'm just cold and honoring, I, I yelled across the street at him, come on. Let's go. Come on. What are you waiting for? And normally he would have been more conservative and just um, waited for some time careful. that would have been more, yeah, more careful. Uh, found a, a more careful way across, but I created that urgency for him to come across. And so he started going across when he normally probably wouldn't have. He would have waited for more of an open spot to go through. And But he got out there and got turned around and, and he got hit by a car. And... Um, you know, it just, it was, it's to this day, I can still see that vividly in my yeah. mind, how it all happened. And, but he, um, he flew through the air, flailing through the air, uh, landed probably about 50 feet away, bounced across the pavement. And, uh, I just freaked out. And I, again, I, I ran over to him. I'm surprised I didn't get hit by a car again by doing that and just knelt down by him. And he was motionless. And he was just kind of in a fetal position, and I was just terrified and scared to death and just screaming, like, don't die, don't die, don't die. I'm only 10 years old. I don't know what to do. Wow. Yeah. And so, anyway, it was just, it was, I mean, it was, it was actually, I won't go into the gruesome parts of it. Yeah, that's. Because there was some blood and stuff. Yeah, but, and, and I, I appreciate that, yeah, and I think yeah. that's sufficient. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, but I'm there, and then this other, this other guy shows up, and I'm screaming at him, I'm this is my brother. He's gonna, he can't die. He can't die. He's like, and he, the guy was trying to calm me down. He was doing a really good job about doing that. People started gathering around and, and, uh, I don't know how long it, I'd been there, but I was kneeling right at him and with, with this guy to my left and, and these people were gathering around and somebody pulled me by the shoulders and pulled me back up off my knees and just whispered in my ear, go call your mom. And I, I don't know who that was at that time. And so, uh, wandering off. I don't know where I got a dime to call on a pay phone to call my mom, but then I called my mom, and then that's just the events of the night happened. Yeah. Uh, let's stop right there for a mm-hmm. minute, and let's let's talk about this. This is about the time that my life merged with yours. Yeah, shortly and, after. And in fact, my mother was driving over to the new home we would be moving into mm-hmm. and had driven past the scene of that accident. Wow. And that that just left a really deep impression on her. She, it was a very somber event for her. And it, it's interesting that those events um, cemented our lives together. Um, and as as I see it, that day when Phil lost his brother, it was shortly after that that he gained me as a brother. Yep. And then we were thick as thieves. Mm-hmm. Um. And there's a reason why I wanted to give the, the background of this. Um, 
so many years later, Phil and I, you know, we're still friends, and um, I was able to start talking to Phil about this depression that followed him around, a black cloud. And this depression was something that Phil dealt with by not dealing with. Right. You know, so we talk about the fleas in the jar, and we, we learn how to live with limitations. And what we, that becomes part of our normal. And so you are carrying around this heavy emotional baggage. Shame, guilt. Shame and guilt. Because I felt like that I was the one that provoked him to do what got him killed. Yeah. And what I'd like to point out here, you know, for those of you who have heard the term um, survivor's guilt, you know, Phil had survived. He had watched his best friend, his brother, killed. And, and there was a hidden narrative buried away in his mind that was constantly causing him to feel like that was his fault, that, that if he wouldn't have been acting a certain way, then that wouldn't have happened. Right. And, and it was shame. And it was the unspoken shame. Mm -hmm. You know, and in that chapter in the book um, where I talk about Phil's story, I, I believe the, the title of, of that chapter is, Do I Deserve to Be Happy? And, and I want you to think about that question. If I believed I didn't deserve to be happy, would that prevent me from even trying to be happy? Yeah. It very well could. It's a mindset. And, and in some ways, that was actually active in your mind, and it was imposing a punishment that you felt that you deserved. And so you had accepted, in a way, your fate in the jar. Mm -hmm. Well, Phil and I decided to do some hypnosis and I just want to talk about hypnosis before we go into this part. Um, I will be talking about hypnosis over and over in this podcast. But there are some misnomers around hypnosis that I would like to address. Uh, I think Hollywood does a pretty good job of painting hypnosis out to be sinister or magical or mystical. And, and I agree. I have seen some very miraculous, magical results with hypnosis. So it is amazing, but I would like to demystify some of the, some of the components of hypnosis for the average listener to, to just open your mind up and listen to what I have to say here. The average human being goes into hypnosis on their own, on average, 30 times per day. That's three zero. And if you want a scientific explanation of what is hypnosis really. Hypnosis is nothing more than when your brain waves slow down and they move into a range of theta. That's T-H-E-T-A, theta. And that's when your brain waves are running between, I don't know, five and seven hertz. So I want to contrast that with the typical waking consciousness Normally, when we're in the busiest part of our day and our mind is active and busy and we're working or we're stressed out, our brain waves are typically running in the beta range. That's B-E-T-A. And in fact, sometimes when we're really stressed out, our brain waves are going to be pushing between 25 and upwards of 30 hertz. So if you want to think of theta or hypnosis, that's when my brain waves slow down to 5 hertz. So that's a significant decrease in brain activity. Your brain calms down. Your brain slows down. And so basically, hypnosis is nothing more than imagination. It's, it's that time in the day when you zone out. It's that time when you're driving in the car and you can't figure out where the last hour went. Where Day, did, daydreaming? Yeah, daydreaming is hypnosis. Uh, I can guarantee you that when you're watching television when you're watching a movie, if you're really into that show, you go into hypnosis. So it, it slows your brain waves down and you get lost into that mindset. In fact, some people might go into hypnosis when they're reading my book. 
I, I go into hypnosis all the time when I'm reading. What that basically means is my eyeballs follow all of the words on a page, and when I get to the bottom of the page, I have no idea what I just read. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll call that zoning out. But anyway, I'm explaining a little bit about hypnosis. Hypnosis is the opposite of sleep. And there are many levels of hypnosis. Light imagination is hypnosis. But you can also go into deep levels of hypnosis. Uh, you can go all the way down. And in some of those deeper levels of hypnosis, your awareness will increase by a magnitude of 20. That's 20 times more aware than normal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if, some, if the listener is thinking right now, um, what would it be like if you could double your awareness. So just imagine if you got into that space where it's 20 times more aware. And that, and basically, when you get into that mindset and your brain waves slow down, um, a door opens where you gain access into the subconscious realm. And it's important to understand that the subconscious realm can harbor ideas. It can harbor limiting beliefs. We talked about that earlier. And, and with Phil... Um, you were carrying a limiting belief that you should be punished. You didn't deserve to be happy. And what I'm pointing out here right now is if you feel like you should be punished or you don't feel worthy of being happy or healthy, then that very thought is the lid on the jar. Right. And that's something you won't fight against anymore because you've got a sore head. You've bounced against yeah. that lid enough times that you finally just consigned yourself. You submitted to it. It's like, this is my new normal. And let's talk about context for just a minute. Um, Phil would go into depression, and not necessarily knowingly, but it would always start in February. Right. So that terrible trauma that Phil had gone through in February would be like an alarm clock. Every time we hit February, it would activate that cold weather and, you know, that association would just become activated. And, and that would create the dark cloud that you just learned to accept as normal. Right. And, you know, did it occur to you that you could do something about that? I mean, what was well, your coping as mechanism? As you're talking about that, uh, it, it just comes to my mind that it was just a natural, becomes so, so natural, it just was part of who I was at that time that I didn't, I didn't ever fight against it. Didn't ever think that there was, and then there was no way I was going to tell anybody because of the shame that I felt. Yeah. And so I just always kept it pushed that deep down inside, but it just, February was a bad month for me. And because I never went and visited my brother's grave wow. in February when he, you know, on February 3rd when he died. Wow. It was just, um, and even my, my, my ex-wife, the mother of my children, when I told her about this uh, a couple of years ago, after we discovered this, She's like, no wonder, because her birthday was in February. She says, it wow. just seems like you were off throughout that time of February. Yeah, you were off on her birthday. Yeah. And, and so that would create this annual cycle of chaos. Mm -hmm. And so there's this dark cloud of suffering. And I, I just want to point out again that Phil learned how to carry this burden, and that became a part of his normal. Mm-hmm accepting those limitations. And that's what I'm going to say is I, I say again that, in my opinion, depression is nothing more than trying to accept suffering as normal. When you try to just accept these, you know, that it's, this is as good as it gets, so what's the point of, of trying anything definition. else? Yeah. And so what we helped Phil learn is that, well, first of all, we took the lid off the jar. We were able to go in, and um, I was able to do some NLP with Phil before we did the hypnosis. And with the NLP, it was essentially, let's delve into the subconscious perspective. Now, I'm going to say this many times through the course of this podcast. I'll say it now. And in fact, I can't say this enough because it's an important concept that I want you to hear as the listener. I want you to remember this. When we turn seven or eight years old, something changes in the brain. There's this wall that's formed. It's, it's called the critical factor. I also talk about this phenomenon in my book. 
But when the critical factor is formed, it actually creates a barrier that separates the conscious from the subconscious. So it's no longer just one field. It's now separated with a wall. And that barrier creates some interesting problems. In Phil's case, that wall would do its best to block out what happened Mm -hmm. with Ronnie. That's right. Out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. Human nature is typically, when you go through that type of trauma, when you are in survival mode, you deal with it by not dealing with it. Right. You avoid the void. Mm -hmm. And so that wall will actually try and help you by blocking that from view. But what I want to point out here is the, the amount of trauma and suffering that Phil went through, not only when he saw that happen, but every time for the rest of his life when he was triggered, and especially in the month of February, that those emotions would activate and flood your body. 40 years of it. 40 years of it. But now you have this wall that's doing its best to hide that from you, Mm -hmm. to help you deal with it by not dealing with it. But deep down in the limbic system of your brain, your brain is triggering the release of these chemicals and hormones that create and reinforce the shame and the trauma. Mm -hmm. It's a chemical reaction. So your body is trained to create those emotions outside of your awareness Mm -hmm. and without your permission, running on automatic pilot. That's exactly what was going on. And, And your mode of living through this was living with it, dealing with it, accepting that as normal. And I, I would say that out in the world, the, the, the really dominant narrative is, quote, if you suffer from depression, there's nothing you can do. Mm-hmm. And I am here to emphatically state that I disagree with that. In fact, you know, when I wrote the book, The Miracle Bridge, it started with my wife asking me to start recording these amazing miracles that we were witnessing on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. We were losing track of how all of these miracles and losing track of these people that were getting better. And so we decided to start writing down the stories and eventually that evolved into the miracle bridge, which is really just a handful of the many miracles that I witnessed. But we started to record these stories because of the profound transformation we were able to see people go through. And that's worth talking about, even if it contradicts your current limitations that there's nothing you can do about depression. And I'm here to state emphatically that depression exists for a reason. And if you can get over that wall and find out what that is, and if you can go disrupt that automatic hidden negative narrative And if you can revise that, then you can let go of the root cause of depression and the symptoms will go away. And so what I want to really loop back to here, in the subconscious mind, there is no such thing as rational thought. The logical, the conscious mind The conscious mind speaks a different language than the subconscious mind. The conscious mind speaks logical, rational thought. But hear me again, because of that wall, the critical factor, there is no such thing as rational thought in the subconscious mind. And so what that means is irrational can exist, and it can be hidden from your awareness. It can be hidden from your conscious view. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, there's a, there's a uh, proverb that talks about uh, a double-minded mind accomplishes nothing. And I want to talk about what that means for a minute, double-minded. That means that part of me feels this way, but part of me feels this way. And I have this internal conflict 
that can't resolve. And the, the conflict exists because there's an irrational element of justification that lives in the subconscious mind that is at war with the conscious desire to change. Mm-hmm. And that's something I'll explore in, in future podcasts where we're going to talk about that. But what I want you to understand is through everything that you had suffered that had gathered through a lifetime, you could think of each experience where you felt that shame as one dot in a dot-to-dot puzzle. Okay. And if you connect those dots together, it's a puzzle that creates a dragon. And that dragon is shaded with shame and unworthiness and fear and guilt. And it's hidden behind a wall, but it's that thing that's always lurking. It's always creating a cloud. And what are you going to do about it? Because it's always been there. And since you haven't ever found the solution, then you have learned to accept that that's just the way it is. And that has infused into your disposition. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, I, yeah. So my disposition is, I don't do anything about it. What can I do about it? Well, I had no idea. Yeah, you I have no know, idea. I didn't even have the power, didn't have the knowledge. So, know. so listen carefully. You don't even know that you don't know. And you're just, this is just how you got through a day. But you're going through these bouts of depression and there's really nothing that you can do about it. Now, I appreciate you taking the time to let me really, you know, lay the foundation for this. Um, how many of you out there listening to this have been through trauma that you can't get over? And people that are suffering with PTSD, um, reliving trauma that you can't shake out of your system, and you're reliving those negative emotions that are firing by themselves without your participation, without your permission. How many people out there are suffering with depression under the delusion that there's nothing you can do about it except maybe take a pill that might take the edge off the symptoms and might not? And I'm telling you that that prevailing narrative needs to be updated. These conversations need to start happening, and again, uh, Heartfelt thanks for you having the courage to come and talk about something so painful because those who are listening to this are going to find a new narrative and they're going to find that there is actually a simple solution Mm -hmm. to their emotional suffering. They just haven't found yet. It's my honor to be here. Yeah, and it's my honor to be here too. Uh, This is a conversation that needs to happen. So... Phil came in, and we decided to do hypnosis. And I took Phil into a hypnosis, and he went deep. Now, part of the reason he was willing and able to go into hypnosis is because he trusts me. And he knew what we were going to do. He didn't exactly know what was going to happen. But I remember the day I was sitting in my wellness center. I was sitting in the front office, and Phil walked into the room. And I was overwhelmed with a spirit that choked me up to where tears came to my eyes and I couldn't speak. And I'm going to tell you, Phil, there's no question in my mind that Ronnie walked in with you. Mm Mm-hmm. And Ronnie had some plans, and he was going to utilize some skills that that I've developed to help you put something to bed once and for all. But I'll never forget how I felt when you walked in. Do you remember? I remember walking in. I couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. I, I was choked up with what walked in with you. And there was a miracle getting ready to happen. Now, I want to just point something out here. Um, I'm not claiming to be a miracle worker. In fact, the title of my book, The Miracle Bridge, Let Go and Let God Heal. Mm -hmm. When I wrote the book, I was so conflicted because there was no way I could exclude God from the book. 
because God had so much to do with me arriving at this place. He had given me some innate God-given abilities, and I just had to include God, and I have to include God here. So we will be discussing God in this podcast. We should. And so God is the miracle worker. And what he uses me for, if God is the surgeon, then I'm, I'm the assistant. I do the prep work. And, you know, I clean things up and, you know, draw the lines. You know, and mm-hmm. I do all of the, the prep work. But it is God who comes in and does the healing. And so I'm not claiming to be a miracle worker, but I am claiming emphatically that if you do the prep work correctly— and you're willing to let go of the story that you've spent a lifetime carrying, God will take it. And the absence of that story is healing. There's a narrative that you have to let go. There's a justification that you have to release in order to create space for something better to come in and occupy And that's exactly what we were going to do with Phil. He was carrying shame and guilt. And if he wouldn't have been impatient and so forth, then that wouldn't have happened to Ronnie and he wouldn't have had to feel responsible. Mm -hmm. When we took Phil into hypnosis, I felt guidance. And I just knew we needed to go back to the scene of the accident. I just knew it. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't always take someone there, by the way. That's, that's not always what I do. It's, but I knew to take you back there. I remember a specific phrase when we took you back to the scene of the accident and we froze that moment in time. And I felt this question come over my mind and I asked you, Phil, I said, I want you to notice what's really happening here that you didn't notice when that accident happened. And maybe you can take that from here. It, do, you, do you have a, a reference to turn to on this? I can help you if you don't. Um, no, I just, I was, I was you taking me to that spot where I was on my knees again, right there with my brother and all the, the things that were going on. And it was, I was reliving that exact moment again. Yeah. And um, I remember you telling me after I came out of hypnosis, like, whoa, what happened there? Because... Apparently, I was had that same kind of frantic, had some screaming and yeah. some things like that. Mm-hmm. And, and if I remember correctly, you said that it actually kind of scared you a little bit because I was yeah freaking out. Well, so you were reliving it, not no. remembering it. No, I was living it. So you I went was back. There. You went back to the right scene there. of that accident. I was reliving it. Yeah, I mean, it was just as the day, the night that it happened. Yeah. Now, when when you started to go in hypnosis, that's called an ab reaction. You're starting to trigger the emotional reaction of the original event. Mm -hmm. And what I did do is I interfered at that point, Mm -hmm. and I froze that moment in time, and I asked you to notice something that you hadn't noticed before. Yeah. And this is when something changed for you. Oh, this is when it all happened. I was was on my knees again and just freaking out. Uh, The people were around, and... um, at the time somebody pulled me back up off my knees by my shoulders. This time I, I turned and looked to see who it was. And it was my brother. It was Ronnie. It was Ronnie. And the only thing that was different about him is he, was, he wasn't a 12 year old anymore. He was like 22, 24 in that area. He, he grabbed me by the shoulders and he just, he looked at me just as proud as could be just eye to eye. And he communicated with me. He didn't move his lips, but I could hear him talking. It was just a little bit of a mature voice than what he had when he was um, 12. And he just grabbed me. He just had that most proud look in his face. He had that kind of a bronze demeanor in his skin that just like kind of celestialized and just had proud and happiness in his eyes and that, and that tight-lipped smile that he used to have. And he grabbed me by my shoulders, and he, he communicated with me. He didn't say any word he said words but his mouth didn't move and he just said you have got to let it go it's okay it's not your fault you've got to let it go that's all he said and so 
as soon as he realized that I had, had accepted that, he was gone. Just like that. Just like that. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about how Ronnie must have felt for us to be able to get you to the space mm-hmm. where you could hear a message from him that actually contradicted the very narrative that you had punished yourself with for over 40 years. Think about yeah. that. Think of the message. How long had he been transmitting and conveying that message that you were unable to hear because it contradicted your internal, irrational, subconscious narrative? Because of my wall. Because of your wall. Mm-hmm. Because I accepted, had accepted myself and in my heart and my soul that there wasn't anything that could be done. And I was, there was no way I was going to come out um, on my own and tell anybody. Yeah. I just, I'd never, that was the first time after I came out of that hypnosis, that was the first time I ever told anybody it was you. The truth will set you free. Yeah. The very thing that you feared the most was the very thing that actually liberated you from unnecessary suffering. Right. And I want to talk a little bit about structurally what actually happened in that moment. Mm -hmm. Now, we know in science today that in the limbic center of the brain, it actually encodes pain and trauma that's connected to the memories. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the emotion from the past is connected to the memory. And any time you would have anything that would trigger an association of Ronnie would automatically create the guilt that would reinforce the self-punishment narrative. Right. And that would happen behind the wall over and over again, flooding your body with hopelessness and helplessness. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. An irrational subconscious narrative that contradicted the very message that Ronnie had been trying to get through to you for over 40 years. Yeah, it shielded me from you. And let me tell you what happened. When he put his hands on your shoulder, he filled you with his love. Right, of course. And that love passed right into that memory, and it re-encoded the trauma in your brain. And so now that memory that you could talk about today without falling apart, Mm -hmm. it is infused with that moment that Ronnie placed his hands on your shoulders and filled you with love and so now that memory is something you can visit without having to relive and when you talk about it now your eyes are filled with tears and it's so amazing to me phil because i grew up with you and Mm -hmm. there's no one tougher than phil cook you don't mess with phil And I always appreciated that because, you know, you were the guy that would take care of me. You'd look after me. But part of that tough man persona was to keep your emotions to yourself. Right. You stay shut down. You can be tough and aggressive in your sports, you know, and you excelled with wrestling and football, you know. And I think that, that that stuff you were carrying actually fueled you and took you to that next level of disregard for your own well-being. Right. Reckless dis- That makes sense. Reckless abandonment, right? Mm-hmm. But Phil had that wall where no one was going to get in. Right? That's true. And and but but that was part of your normal. That was part of how you evolved. So in other words, what happened with with Ronnie when you were 11? And, and also other, you know, environmental circumstances in your home collectively to, came together to, mm-hmm. to desensitize mm-hmm. so that you're no longer vulnerable. Because when I love, when I'm open, I get hurt. And so it's like how a callus replaces a blister. Right. And that wall forms, and it's now working on its own. And because I don't deserve to be happy, it was my fault. I don't deserve to get closer to people. There's that fear. If you get too close to me, you might know that I'm Mm -hmm. not worthy. And if I don't feel worthy, I wonder how that plays out into my life. 
if I'm carrying that around with me, I wonder what type of recklessness that could actually inspire because of that disregard. But nonetheless, that's just how I learned to perceive myself and the world. Um, it, uh, it just makes me think about when I was younger. I just, I was pretty well closed off. I was, I was approachable, but it was all of that. You just it explained. It was just, I wouldn't let anybody in. Yeah. And that was part of your normal. Mm-hmm. It's just simple as that. Yeah. And the day that we took Phil into hypnosis back to Ronnie and we opened up the dialogue, Ronnie shattered a, a worthless narrative. He did. In a moment. But he was only able to do that because you were humble enough to go look. Mm-hmm. You were brave enough to, to revisit something that you had avoided for a lifetime. And that was the passage. That was the rite of passage. And w- what I really want to talk about here is ultimately because of that one experience that we had in hypnosis where we shattered the worthless narrative and Ronnie infused his love and fed it into that past trauma and healed that memory of the past. The black cloud lifted that day, didn't it, Phil? It did. Now, like I say, I appreciate the vulnerability. Uh, You can see Phil is, he is experiencing the gratitude of this moment because Phil went through a transformation and depression was a thing of the past. And we pulled the tip of the splinter out. And now Phil has opened his heart and that wall. I mean, think about the quality of your life after that. How do you know what life is without a wall if that's how you've always lived? Oh, it's black and white. It's, it's completely different. The way that I love, the way that I, I care, my concern for people and others. It's just opened up my whole being that to realize that my whole purpose to be here on this planet is just to serve others wow. and help others find happiness. And now here you are talking on the Miracle Bridge. It's an honor. Sharing the miracle that you experience that most people in this world wouldn't believe is possible. No, it's possible. And, and so let's, let's talk about how, where this goes from here. If this can happen for you with that level of trauma, then I wonder if it can happen for them. Oh, no doubt about it. No shadow of a doubt. And what if they've developed that? they just got to be open. That's they've right. They've got to be willing to face that fear. To doubt their doubts. Yeah to revisit a hopeless narrative, Mm -hmm. to look up at the top of the jar. just got to be open to it. And see that there is no lid. Mm -hmm. No shadow of a doubt. So that is our message today. Phil is a living, walking miracle and proof that sometimes what we call depression is not depression at all. It's just a collection of of experiences and false ideologies that ultimately, when removed, creates a new season. Spring always supplants winter. Right. And a new season is always available to us, and it's available to you. So I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Phil, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you here. You had to be my first guest. There was just no question about it. And I'm sure I'm going to have you back many times in future conversations. Thank you for the courage to share your story, to share that authentic, genuine nature that was always hidden behind that wall that no longer exists. It's, it's my honor to be here. I am I'm overjoyed. And um, it's just something that is, it's overdue to be shared with everybody else. That's right. To hopefully give some hope. Yeah. We're here to infiltrate the narrative. Yeah. We're changing the narrative, and we're bringing truth. We're bringing God back into the conversation, and we're going to keep talking. Yeah. And if I can say something, it's just 
if there's something that you're holding back that you've you're guilty of or have some self guilt or you feel such a profound shame, you just keep pushing it down and pushing it down year after year after year after year. Stop. There is a way out of that. There really is. I did it for forty years. And um I'm sure that my brother Ronnie was always trying to break through. Yeah. And and help me understand. I'm sure that it hurt him on the other side knowing that I was carrying that type of guilt and that type of shame and, and you know, my heart was hurt and broken because of it. And but face your fears. Um it's not an easy thing to do. But it can be done. And it's it's not nearly as hard as you might think. Let go and let God take it. That's right. And create a new narrative. Mm-hmm. And move on with more happiness. I mean, it just, my happiness is compounded um, beyond measure. And just to be around people and, and talk about things. This, this is a story that I, I, I hold sacred. It's an, I, I share it now when I feel prompted to do so. I just don't freely throw it out there, but it's, I will share it when I feel prompted. And I've shared it quite a bit with some people. Which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Opening your soul, being vulnerable, and having other people benefit from what you've suffered through. Yeah. So that they don't have to suffer the way you've suffered. Yeah. And, and just look at the integrity in that. Mm-hmm. If, if my story can lessen your suffering, mm-hmm. then, then hear it and, and go do something about it. Do not let shame and secrets control your life. Right. Get it out. Yeah. You'll be amazed when you come out the other side, just how much stronger, how much better that it's just that refiner's fire that brings you through. And, and, um, you you find a a whole new level of happiness. You're, you'll learn that you have more of a capability or capacity to love on a much higher level that you weren't even aware that you could do. You could love on that level. And that's what this has done for me. Yeah. The absence of shame mm-hmm. is liberation. Wow. Well said. Simple and beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for tuning in. Um, it was a pleasure to have this conversation with you today and looking forward to many conversations coming hereafter. Until next time, this is Mike checking off. <laughs>